I'm, I'm, I'm Bob Surge. I want to introduce you um, <clears throat> to our speaker of the day. But first, let me mention that you're at the Southport Historical Society's arm, armchair history tour. These uh, armchair programs, as you many know, and a lot of you have participated in for the last couple couple months, kind of designed these to uh, to help us all keep keep busy and and connected with our with the community. Anyway, I think we have another another good program for you for you today. Today's program is going to be a tour of the Brunswick County old old jail. Uh, this is the premier uh, museum site of the of the society, and the speaker is going to be Nancy Christensen, who is a, the curator of the old the old jail, and. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nancy and she can give you the overview of the tour. Liz, can you unmute Nancy? Yes, I will. And um, as I'm doing that, I also just want to mention that uh, I want to thank, uh, oh, the thank Harper you. Library and Friends of the Library for their support in, um, uh, in helping us publicize these programs. I'm just looking for, I'm scrolling down trying to find Nancy's uh, thing here. Sorry. Uh, Nancy, can you see your, I don't see you. Can you see yourself? Uh, here we go. There she is. There she is. Got it. Okay, I'm unmuted. You all right now? You're good, good to go. Okay, thank you, Bob, very much for that introduction. And um, good afternoon and welcome to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, again, I am Nancy Christensen and I'm curator of the Old Brunswick County Jail Museum in Southport, North Carolina. I, my husband Charles and others uh, are here to give you an armchair tour of the museum and tell you its history and interesting anecdotes. Thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, there will be an opportunity at the end. I don't, I don't We're not seeing any slides. Bob, you don't see the so slides. Can we go back to meeting? No. I can see the slides, Nancy. Oh, okay, here there we are. are. Here we are, thank you. <laughs> the building was erected in 1904 by the county commissioners. The Historical Society was given permission to renovate the jail so it could become a museum. And that was around 1994. They opened as a museum in 2004 and we are responsible for all the maintenance. Southport was chartered in 1792 by the state and named for one of its founders, General Benjamin Smith, and called Smithville. In later years, the name was changed to Southport when there was an effort to turn the town into a major port on the Cape Fear River. During the colonial period, these stocks and pillory were used for lawbreakers to hold their heads, arms, or legs. The Old Jail Museum is operated by the Southport Historical Society, and we sell a number of books about the history of the city and county and the Cape Fear region. Among those, among those books are recipe books, two of which include some history along with the recipes and are big sellers. The 
this wooden structure in the uh, picture preceded the old jail and was built in 1850. It was burned down by a prisoner in an attempt to escape, and he did. Then the county commissioners were tasked with replacing the wood structure and put out for bid for a building constructed of brick, concrete, and steel. This photo shows how thick the walls are. And since 1904, it has survived a lot of storms. This display case has books, games, and toys in it from the turn of the 20th century, since we know there were some jailers who lived on the first floor with their families and kept the prisoners on the second floor. If you notice, the doll furniture in the display case, uh, the dressers were not made for dolls but were actually salesman samples when salesmen traveled from town to town and door to door. Unfortunately, only one booking book has survived the passage of time, but this one makes for very interesting reading as it lists the names of the prisoners, charges against them, dates, ages, and case disposition, as well as the names of the sheriff and jailer at the time. This book covers the decades of the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. After the colonial period, the first jail to be built in Southport was 1818, followed by the aforementioned 1850 structure, then this one in 1904, and then the jail behind this one in 1971. In 1978, the Brunswick County seat moved to Bolivia and has had two jails built there. The first jail in Bolivia was taken down in order to construct the current one. This case uh, that you're looking at now was developed to illustrate the kinds of foods fed the prisoners in the early 1900s and how some of them were prepared and preserved. Common then were rice and beans, chicken and ham, preserved fruit and vegetables. Fortunately, the chickens were not the rubber kind as you see in the case. Many times it was the job of the jailer's wife to cook for the prisoners. And in later years, local restaurants provided the meals, most notably the Pines restaurant during the 1960s and 1970s. The Pines restaurant was owned by the Worley family where three meals a day were prepared for the old jail prisoners. The worldly children brought the food to the jail in disposable containers and prisoners could order from the menu. Prisoners were permitted to order cigarettes also from the restaurant, which they had to pay for themselves. Tragically, the restaurant owner, Jack Worley, was stabbed there and died from his injuries. No assailant has ever been found. This is called the 1904 room, as it represents what the first floor may have looked like when the jailer and his family lived here. Most jailers lived in town and the jail was only a part-time job. Here, note the old stove, fueled by coal. Can you find the butter churns? The milk can and coffee grinder. We offer children the opportunity to go on a scavenger hunt to find a number of artifacts as they tour the museum. The flag on the wall has only 45 stars. 
In 1904, Utah became the 45th state. There are bars on all windows and doors of the building. And inside the building, there are original doors with locks and bars on all cells for added security. The old jail was not built with electricity. So between 1904 and 1914 or 15, the jailer had to make do with kerosene or oil lamps, as you see here. The quilt on the bed is 100 years old and belonged in the home of Dr. Watson, who also owned the pharmacy in Southport. Note the spittoon on the floor. This was, after all, a tobacco state. In 1904, this structure was built with no indoor plumbing. So here is a chamber pot and washstand. In later years, a sink and toilet were installed in the cells. However, when the society took over the building, the plumbing was in such poor condition, the decision was made to remove it and return to the early days. When I once asked a group of children what the prisoners had to do, since there was no bathroom, one little girl said, hold it. Here is some period clothing from the turn of the 20th century and an old treadle sewing machine operated by the footpiece on the floor. Next to it is an old leather suitcase and it always freaks out boys in a group when I tell them that the boys at that time also wore the white dress on the right as toddlers. This is Susan Lachlan, who lived in the jail on the first floor with her husband, who was the jailer, and their three children. We know this since they were all listed, including the prisoners upstairs, in the 1910 census. Susan would have been expected to cook for the prisoners as well as her family, and we have here her recipe for tipsy cake. One of our docents followed the recipe and some of us had a taste. Now we know where it got its name. We are blessed today to have her great grandson here to tell you a bit more about the family. And his name is Joe Lachlan. Joe, are you on? Yep. She's nodding her head now. Okay, am I heard? Yes, yes. go ahead, please. Okay. Well, the Lachlan family, um, as far as I can tell, came from Ireland originally. I know that because there is reference of my great-great-grandfather uh, as being the Irishman. Uh, and I assume that what happened is during the potato famine, the Lachlan family moved to Manchester, England, because my first actual record is two brothers leaving Manchester, England, and uh, arriving at Norfolk, Virginia, uh, in America. Uh, one David and one uh, James. Uh, David, uh, one side of the family, uh, died early. But he had another son, he had a son, David, uh, who for some reason was raised by a fairly wealthy businessman in Chicago. Uh, that man was associated with P.T. Barnum and for uh, quite a number of years, uh, David was a, uh, one of the top performers at the American Museum that B.T. Barnum had in New York City. Uh, David went on to found 
uh, a circus family who performed under the name of Costello. And there were about, um, I think, four generations of the Lachlans performing under the name Costello. Uh, and they did all kinds of acts. At one time, uh, one of the, the acts was the, the highest paid circus act in America. The other side of the of that uh, of those two brothers, uh, James Joseph, who was my great great grandfather, uh, he uh, was listed as an officer in the Confederacy, and seemed to spend the majority of his uh, military career in prisoner of war camps. He was captured four different times. And one of the places that he was, was at um, uh, Johnson's Island uh, on the Lake Erie in, uh, in Ohio, which was very close to where I used to live. And I was able to find from my readings up there that he actually had a minstrel group and put on shows at um, the prisoner of war camp. Um, he then married Molly, uh, who was the daughter of a shoe manufacturer in Warrington, uh, North Carolina, and eventually uh, managed that plant. And he raised seven children, one of which was J.J. Lachlan, my great-grandfather, who married um, Susan, who you saw a picture of just a, a few minutes ago. And, and she was from the Warrington area also. And then they moved to Southport in the late 1800s, 1890s. Well, when J.J. Uh, Lachlan moved to Southport, uh, he evidently was a fairly wealthy man because at one time he owned um, three out of the four properties at the corner of Moore and Howe, um, uh, one of which was the Lachlan Building, which was, before it burnt, was uh, at the corner where Cape Fear Jewelry is today. He also owned all the property uh, from where both are corner is down to where Ty Peppers is. That was all his. Uh, he was in a multitude of different businesses. He was in quite a few different uh, real estate uh, ventures. Uh, he was one of the people who was instrumental in bringing the railroad into Southport. Uh, and during that venture, um, you know, he, he thought that Southport was going to become a major uh, southern port and that there would be a lot of growth and he was, he bet his, basically bet his future on Southport becoming very successful. Um, it didn't work out so well for him. Uh, but uh, as the, the railroad got laid out, he went up and bought a square mile of property north of Boiling Springs and uh, laid out the town of Lachlan. And you'll see uh, actually on the, the picture that's um, being shown right now, uh, there is a stop on that rail line uh, for the town of Lachlan, which cost you 50 cents to get from uh, Southport to uh, the town of Lachlan although there was never a house there, as far as I know. Uh, but as the years went by, uh, he drifted from this to that. Uh, he was in quite a, I, I know he was, uh, uh, he ran a hardware store at one time. Uh, he was, uh, a, he worked at the bank at one time. Uh, we found out from the census that evidently he was the jailer uh, at one time. But uh, it seems as the years went by, uh, he had less and less influence and 
I would assume less and less money and uh, uh, financially did not, things did not work well for J.J. Laughlin. Uh, he had three children. Uh, he had uh, James Albert Laughlin, who became the um, city engineer for Wilmington and served at that capacity for many, many years. Uh, my Aunt Gertrude Lachlan, uh, who was a school teacher here in Brunswick County and uh, the first librarian. Um, and then my great grandfather, uh, Joseph Jackson, Lachlan. And uh, he was uh, at one time, I know, an accountant uh, up at a fertilizer plant in Wilmington. Um, my dad said for a time during the uh, uh, prohibition, uh, he ran a speakeasy out on uh, Oak Island. And then in more recent times when, when I knew him, uh, he was the business manager for uh, Dozier Hospital. Um, let's see what if I had anything else in my notes. Um, no, not really. Uh, as a child, um, we lived in, I, my parents lived in Ohio and we would come down here on vacations and we would always visit uh, my grandparents who lived on uh, Caswell and I would always visit uh, my grandmother Lachlan, Susan Lachlan. Uh, she lived on Bay Street along with her daughter, Gertrude, and that was a favorite stop. We would go in there and uh, eat some cookies and be called sugars uh, at, um, at their house. Uh, the other side of the family, which is a whole different story and I'll leave for another day, uh, was my grandmother side of the family, uh, the Brinkman side of the family, and they bring in all of the maritime um, traditions uh, here in Southport. They were lighthouse keepers and life saving station captains and blockade runners and that type of thing, but for another day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate very much your uh, joining us today. In this picture, we have many storyboards. We, this is one of our many storyboards on the walls of the jail. And this one tells about a grand jury investigation into the condition of the jail in 1914. The report states that the place stank. The prisoner mattresses needed to be burned along with the cots and that all of it should be replaced. The county commissioners were further advised uh, to have it wired for electricity. The left photo in the picture shows the fencing around the building at that time and uh, on the right, in the right photo in the rear is the back of the old jail when there was no fence. In that picture, the structure on the right of the photo is of the train station when the railroad came to town to deliver coal to the steamships. The railroad is here from 1913 to 1943 when the rails were sold to the government to use the steel for wartime use. The society has a whole railroad display at our Garrison Museum, which you might find interesting. This is a copy of the agreement of sale between the county commissioners and the owner of the property the jail was built on. She was Kate Stewart, a businesswoman and inn owner along the river in Southport. The county paid $400 for the lot. When the county seat was still in Southport, attorneys and judges stayed at Kate Stewart's Inn and she developed friendships with many of them to the extent 
that she had influence statewide and helped bring the railroad to town. And here is Miss Trudy McNeil, age four, demonstrating the use of a rotary phone which arrived in Southport in 1940. Trudy McNeil Huffam Young was a docent at the jail in the past, and the Society has an oral history interview of her, ranging on many topics, which is available to see on YouTube, the Southport Historical Society, uh, part of YouTube, YouTube. Trudy has lived in Southport all her life and is a wonderful resource for the society. Below Trudy's photo in the case are some devices we believe the jailer or sheriff may have used during the course of their jobs. When the building behind this one was built as the new county jail, this one, the old jail, became the sheriff offices. The Polaroid camera would have been from later years, but we were told there was one just like it found in the jail when the society renovated the interior. The candlestick phone depended on an operator to connect callers. We have been told the phone company office was in a two-story building on the corner of Howe and Moore Streets, where the Bullfrog Corner store now resides. Obviously, the phone building is no longer there since Bullfrog Corner is only a one story. The need for a typewriter to keep records by the jailer or sheriff is probable. The hinge on the lower shelf is believed to have come from the building originally. There are also keys in the case, which were used in the first jail in Bolivia. And now my husband, Charles, has more of the tour to give you. Charles? Thank you, dear. Um, this is our sheriff jailer's room, developed to honor the sheriff and jailers that worked on this building since it opened in 1904. The first jailer of sheriff of Brunswick County was Thomas Leonard in 1796. At that time, Brunswick County included land that became Columbus County. In 1804, when Southport became the county seat, in place of the Lockwood Folly Shalote area, people on the west side of Brunswick County felt that a county seat needed to be more in the center of the county, so they uh, became Columbus County. The same action happened in 1877 when more of West Brunswick County was annexed by Columbus County. One of the five lists on our list here are list of different men who were elected sheriff before 1904. Displayed is a timeline that we have in the old jail, and it starts with Peter Rourke Jr. from 1903 to 1906, who was the first sheriff to use the jail, up to our current sheriff. We have displayed as many pictures of the different sheriffs and jailers that we could find. Sheriff Peter Rourke Jr. was replaced by Jackson Stanlin in 1907. Ah. Jackson Stanlin was the first sheriff in Brunswick County to be killed. He was uh, a merchant from Lockwood Folly area. People convinced him that he should run for sheriff. He was a merchant, had a place. He ran and won the seat. A man called Jesse Walker, also in the Shalote area, was wanted for breaking into a store in Shalote. When the sheriff Stanley went to arrest Walker at Walker's house, Walker shot and killed the sheriff. The accompanying deputies placed Walker in this jail in November of 1908. About a month later, in January 1909, Walker escaped from this jail. He had made a key to open the cell, then with two other accomplices, overpowered the guard and escaped into the green swamp. 
February of 1909, he was seen around the Lockwood Folly Bridge and was captured and again placed in this jail. He escaped again, went to the Green Swamp and went west. In March of 1915, Walker was recognized by a Wilmington police while on a train, both of them on the same train, coming to this area and he was trying to see his wife and child and he was recaptured. This time they put him in the jail in Wilmington and he was tried and convicted in a Pender County court, not here. He was sentenced to 30 years, placed in the Raleigh Penitentiary from where he escaped in 1919. In 1935, he walked back into the Raleigh Penitentiary, gave himself up, saying that he had found the Lord and God had forgiven him of the murders. On June 6, 1936, he was paroled to a prison in Oklahoma where he had killed a man in 1909, while he was loose from Brunswick County, and was sentenced to 30 years there. He had escaped from that prison too. He was eventually pardoned from Oklahoma, went back to Gosport, Mississippi, to live with his then current wife. He had married her using an alias, he, Frank Manning. He was a jeweler in that area. Isaac Skipper was also killed uh, while on duty. He was on July 14th, 1914, he went to arrest a man who was wanting, to, who had shot up a lodge meeting earlier that day. They were in a crowded store. The man shot and killed Isaac Skipper. Skipper died in the store. As the man fled from the store, an unknown citizen shot the man with a double-barreled shotgun, both of them, and uh, that was the end of him. There's not a whole lot written about this crime. We do know he died. Uh, jailer, James H. Russ. The family name Russ has been associated with law enforcement in Brunswick County for a long time. This is a photograph of jailer James H. Russ, not to be confused with Sheriff James A. Russ, who we should share from 1931 to 32 and again from 35 to 37. J jailer Russ served from 1932 to 38. He was a wood and coal dealer lived across the street on, on Nash Street from the jail. It was right maybe two blocks, two houses down. It was said that when the Russ family was having a reunion, he would empty the jail and put his relatives in there. One of his grandchildren still lives in Southport, and he remembers bringing the food from his grandmother's house over to the jail in a wagon. A trustee in the jail would then pick it up, take it from him, and feed the prisoners. This is the rest of the board. Uh, you will see the decades are uh, broken out by the favorite pistol of the particular time. Uh, and it continues on up to the current time more to the right. We added a prohibition uh, exhibit this year. North Carolina decided to become a dry state in 1908, well before the nation voted in prohibition in 1913. In fact, Brunswick County was voted to be dry in 1901. As with any law, law, the devil is in the detail. If one could get to South Carolina or Wilmington between 1901 and 1913, one could have buy hard liquor or have a friend buy it for them. After 1913, beer and wine were still allowed, but not hard liquor, until the 1919 Volstead Act, which limited the alcohol content in beer and wine. If you could get a doctor's prescription, you could get a municipal alcohol for three dollars a bottle. You would get a pint every 10 days. Watson's Pharmacy would sell it and you can see the little bottles in the middle there uh, with the particular type of alcohol they had. However, all through this time, moonshine liquor was available if you knew where to go. Prohibition was repealed in 1932 with the 21st Amendment to the Constitution. North Carolina has not approved that amendment to this day. President Roosevelt in 31 noted that federal monies were down, revenues were down, and there were quite a few people out of work. So he got the bill, the amendment passed. And crime was up at that time, trying to control the smuggling of the alcohol in the United States. Bunswick County not only had moonshiners, but rum runners. There were people coming in with rum aboard the boats from the ocean. 
1937, North Carolina voted to allow liquor to be sold, to get liquor in Brunswick County, one, and you could go to large cities, north and south. In 50, 1957, Southport got its first ABC store, and thank to Liz for her prohibition talk. Uh, in 1955, the sheriff, this gentleman became sheriff, Albert H. Gray, uh, and moonshine was still being made in, in that particular time frame. His claim to fame uh, was to bust stills. He was from Shalot, um, and he tried to reform the area in his only little self. He had uh, some of the inmates in the jail collect newspaper stories of his actions and create a scrapbook that displayed some of the stills he broke up. We have a copy of that scrapbook. He has said that when he came up for election in 1959, he did not get voted in as the Moonshiner's skin didn't vote for him. They were a little tired of him putting people in jail that they were related to. It was all suggested that, suggested that he leave the area, which he did and went to California. Well, since we've talked about moonshine, and, and moonshine put a lot of people into this jail, we bought a small still, the Historical Society did, to show what one looks like and how it works. Stills are legal to, loan, to own as long as you don't sell the whiskey without paying the tax. We have not used this one. We do have the recipe to make the corn mash and how to cook it and everything else. However, in review of what has to happen, it seems somewhat difficult for us and seems labor intensive. This part is in the display case uh, and underneath the still. And we have taken the photographs from Sheriff Gray's book and made them larger. And they had display several stills that he broke. Some of them created about a thousand gallons a time when they were used. Also displayed uh, on the upper right corner there is his, uh, his badge and some of his calling cards. These items were bought from uh, an auction in Pennsylvania where Sheriff Gray finally settled as a practicing lawyer and they are on loan to the museum. Well with moonshine came the uh, guys who used to run it to the market from wherever the still was. And as you most of you know then, that NASCAR was created from the moonshiners as they had the fast cars to outrun the federal revenueers. Moonshiners had more money than the federal government and they worked on their cars, so they were basically faster. Then it got to be around in the moonshiners, my car is faster than your cars. Okay, let's have a race. So we have chosen two of the North Carolinians that were pretty successful, Junior Johnson and Lee Petty. We have displayed the models of their successful cars. Lee Petty and his son Richard both raced car number 42. Junior Johnson, who died last year, would drive whatever car he built and what was, or what was built for him, and there are no specific car numbers for him. You can now buy Junior Johnson's whiskey at the Southport ABC store because the tax is paid. Uh, we honored, since we honored the sheriffs, we also honored the Southport uh, police chiefs that also used the jail because uh, they were right here in town and they could put people in it. Um, and we have most of them from uh, back in the time frame starting in whenever Southport started to hire police chiefs. We have a collection of photos and stories about these chiefs. Uh, we had one chief who had a petting zoo on, on Franklin Square, uh, the Chief Dove who became a mayor for a while, and the current chief, Tom, Todd Coring. Chief Coring's uh, grandfather was a South Force chief and his grandfather was sheriff. And that's a brief overview of what can be seen in this particular room. Now let's go upstairs and talk to Mrs. Shirley Johnson, who is the first responders patch room. She's in that room. Shirley takes the different responders, uh, first responders patches and emblems that we receive here at the old jail and places them on our display boards, which you see now. Any information about the how the patch was achieved or who owned the patch or why the patch is important to the person who sent it are placed into the patch book by Shirley. 
Shirley's been doing this work for about eight years now, and we thank her for her work. Shirley? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Charles. I enjoy doing this particular volunteer job. Um, welcome to the old jail patch room. When the old jail opened in 2004, we had about a dozen patches for display. As visitors came, they would say, well, there's no patch here from my county or my city or my village. Some would say their cousin is a police officer and they could get us a patch. We welcomed their donations to our collection. As time went by, we had so many asking if they could send us a patch we now have self-addressed envelopes that we give them so they can easily send them to us. Right now, our total count of patches is, a drum roll, 522. 242 of them are from North Carolina, and you're looking at the, one of the North Carolina boards right now in the photo. Um, I lost my place. And uh, we have 272 from other states, which will be um, the next photo. And we also have nine from other countries. And you can see why people want theirs to added to our collection. Some of the earlier ones were very plain, a tan background with brown lettering. Folks who come and see their old patches will very often comment on that fact. Then after they get home, they send us their new ones. Now the patches are all bright and beautiful. They have elaborate insignias embroidered on the patch. The design is usually something that is significant to their town. And for example, um, High Point, North Carolina has a big chair embroidered in the center of their patch. It is put there to honor the furniture manufacturers in their area. Bob, 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 Bob. Thank you. Oops. Could you go back one slide? <laughs> um, in the beginning, most of the patches were from North Carolina. But now with many more tourists coming to town, we're getting more of what we call other state patches. We also have some government departments and commemorative patches. For example, we have a commemorative patch of 9-11 that is very beautiful. We have one from far away, as far away as Alaska. One of our docents has a cousin whose son worked as a village public safety officer or police officer in Kayana, Alaska. Her cousin gave one of his, pat his son's patches to us. Kayana is a village of 331 people located in the Northwest Arctic Borough of Alaska. He described the job as sort of being like the local sheriff of Mayberry. And we can all imagine what that would be like. Many years ago, we acquired our first international patch. It was from Liberia, which is the second row down from the top on the left. That's the one. We now have nine. One day, a gentleman came into the old jail. He was visiting his brother here in Southport. After he got home to Richford, Vermont, he sent us two patches. One was from the U.S. Border Patrol, and the other was from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now you're probably wondering how these are connected. He is retired from the U.S. Border Police, but Border Patrol, and his wife is retired from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now I think we know the rest of that story. This is an example of how we obtain patches from many diverse areas.
This section of our patch room honors our Southport police dogs, Marco, Hera, and Max. They were Belgian Malinois. As you can see on the screen, they look similar to the uh, German Shepherds. The ashes of Marco and, and Hera are buried in our old jail garden under the trellis. The, our garden is located to the right of the building as you face it coming in. The North Carolina State Police were the first to have police dogs in North Carolina. The state owned the dogs and they purchased them with money they collected from the capture of drug dealers. Our Southport Police Department got its first police dog, Mar Marco, in 1988. Over the years, Marco was followed by Marco's granddaughter, Hera, and Max, and then Max. We had police dogs in Southport until 1998. Police officer Jerry Dove owned the dogs. They lived in his home with his family. He had trained dogs when he was in the Air Force, so he became the police dogs trainer also. The Southport police dogs were trained for narcotics detection, in, included marijuana, heroin, cocaine, and opium. They were also trained to track suspects, seek and find evidence of a crime, apprehend and capture suspects, and last but not least, to protect their handler. Police officer Dove received $144 stipend each month for 12 hours of dog training a month. This covered the dog's food, vet bills, and anything else the dog needed. Chief Dove said that the dogs got very excited when they saw the police car. At the end of the working day, he would remove their work collar when they got home. Then they became just regular dogs. That one. That one disappeared. Did I disappear? Oh, geez, what did I do? I touched something on the thing. I'm gone. Oh no. Oh no. You had the tunic. You had to have a tunic on there. Go. What did I what did I do? <laughs> well, just go ahead. You have the oh, there it is. coat I'm, on there. I'm back. Okay. Uh, let's see, where was I? Just a second here. Um, the stipend covered the dog's food, vet bills, and anything else the dog needed. Chief Dog said that the dogs got very excited when they saw the police cars. At the end of the working day, he would remove their work collar and when, when they got home. Then they would become just regular dogs. When the work collar went on in the morning, they seemed to know automatically that they were now going to work. They really loved their work. Today, our Brunswick County Sheriff's Department has a group of working canines. Southport has a sister city in England. Southport, England is located just north of Liverpool on the west coast of England. In 1965, a large delegation of people from Southport, England visited us here in Southport. They brought as a gift to us a jacket, which is shown on your screen now, a hat, a whistle, and some citation forms that were all used by a female British policewoman. In this picture on the bottom shelf to the right is her hat. It has a steel lining in it to protect her from any head injury. Her photo in her uniform is to the left of her hat. The hat on the top shelf was donated to us by a Southport resident who visited Southport, England in the middle 1980s. Because he was from their sister city, he got to meet the mayor and was presented with the hat. It is the hat of a police motor patrol officer. A very nice addition to our collection. 
The cap on the left side of the bottom shelf was given to us. It, it was found in New York City in the Hudson River soon after 9-11-2001. That is why we think it is important. As you can see, it is very worn. Unfortunately, there is no identification on the cap as to who the owner was. The insignia on the cap is that of the New York Police Department Harbor Unit. This is an elite group that patrols 150 miles of New York City's water, waterways. They are on the water every day protecting ferries and doing search and rescues. We thank whoever wore this cap for their service. This concludes my portion of the tour. Thank you for visiting our patch room today and I'll turn it back to Charles. Thank you, thank you, Shirley. Uh, the view we have here is on the second floor and it's a small cell that may have been used for the insane or to uh, be a cell for separation from the rest of the inmates. It might've been a shower. There are stories about prisoners who are trying to break out and were beating up on the jailer. Other prisoners locked the fighting man into, into the bathroom. And this is the only room we could find that was lockable in the old jail. We have a mannequin dressed in a 1980 antique prisoner's uh, uniform who is currently isolated. We call him Frenchy because of his small mustache. We are now going into the graffiti room. Uh, we are on the second floor again. And here you can see uh, the mannequin dressed in a Southport policeman's uniform with the 4th of July badges on him. We call this the graffiti room because we did not paint it. We were told if we painted it, we would blot out history. Also on this photograph, you can see the inner cell door and also the wall, which is uh, kind of dirty and a lot of pencil things on it. We have the desk of jailer Herbert Radcliffe. He worked in the 60s to the 70s. His term for jailer was one of the longest that we can find in jail history. The desk was donated to the old jail by his daughter-in-law, as it seemed fitting since jailer Radcliffe spent a lot of time here in jail. Also on his house down the street across from the fire station on East Nash. We have made this, this desk, his home away from home, more comfortable. Now let us hear from Jailer Radcliffe's grandson, David Radcliffe, is who is here and wants to sh share some of his personal memories with me. Welcome, David. There, I'm unmuted now. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, am Herbert Ratcliffe's uh, grandson, as Charles said. I was the son of, uh, of Harvey Ratcliffe, which was the oldest uh, son for Herbert, uh, and then the grandchild of Herbert and Eva. Um, I was very young in my interactions, uh, and, and I'll refer to him as Granddaddy. I was very young in my interactions with Granddaddy because... Uh, at the time, we lived in Fayetteville, but we came here on the weekends, and we oftentimes stayed with Granny and Granddaddy at their house on um, on uh, Nash and Davis, which I believe now is a Southport end. I always refer to it as Green Gables because of the high-pitched uh, arch of the, of the roof. But we would stay there and, uh, and spend time. Um, my personal memory of Granddaddy, really one of the brightest personal memories I have is that we oftentimes would sat out on the uh, back porch, screened in back porch, and we would have vanilla ice cream and Pepsi Cola float. And we would spend some time together. Uh, but I have to admit, I was very intimidated by granddaddy. He was a no nonsense kind of guy. He was very stern. He was very imposing. I guess all the qualities that made him a great jailer. Uh, so we would sit there on the, on the back porch and and I remember even as a six or seven year old trying to think of things to say <laughs> because he was just, just that kind of guy. Uh, but he did have a, a real physical presence. And I remember he oftentimes wore a fedora and he wore very wide ties uh, that were 
you know, sort of mid-century modern pies. They must have been five inches or more wide. Very colorful. Palm trees and sunsets and hula girls and all that sort of thing. So as stern as he was, I guess there was a side of whimsy to him uh, as a result of, of, wearing, of wearing those ties. And I oftentimes, you know, The Untouchables was a very uh, popular TV show on at that time. And I would often look at Granddaddy and say, hmm, he's the Elliot Ness of Southport. Um, and I know that was a stretch, but I guess that's what a seven-year-old does. As far as my memory of the jail goes itself, uh, I was never allowed to go in the jail. I don't think they felt it was appropriate that a seven-year-old go into a working jail at that point. Uh, but I do remember us preparing meals for the prisoners at the home on, on Nash and Davis. And I'm not sure why we were preparing meals at, at home since they had other facilities. There must have been some interruption of that. But I do remember being there with Granny and with a helper, and we were preparing meals. And my job was very complicated. My job was to put the bread on the plate uh, that was then going to be delivered to the, uh, to the prisoners. So those are really sort of some of my memories of, of, uh, of Granddaddy. And I, I'm very proud and reflective of the time that I have spent in Brunswick County. Uh, Southport and Oak Island. My dad used to own Long Beach Pier in Oak Island. So while we lived in Fayetteville, I spent an awful lot of time in Brunswick County growing up and my son and my grandson live here now, which is uh, also sort of a treat for me. So I do want to thank you for giving me the op opportunity to be part of uh, Southport's history. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. We appreciate the memories that you shared with us and uh, thank you again. And now, I haven't turned it over, dear. Oh, sorry. Charles has more of the graffiti <laughs> room to do. <laughs> ah, you're stepping on me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what? Go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. What? What is a jail without some kind of restraint devices? So here we have our collection of um, handcuffs. In the center, you see a, a thumb cuff. Uh, towards the back, you'll see a reproduction of Alcatraz um, bar, the chains that were around the ankle and on the arms. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the old ball and chain. Let me bring that down. Okay. No, oh, down. <laughs> oh, can we get back to the radar gun? Ah, there it is. This is an antique radar gun uh, for those of us who are a little older. Uh, it was left here by the Sheriff's Department back in the 1970s from 72 to 79 when we had the gasoline shortages. The federal speed limit was mandated as 55 double nickels uh, miles an hour to conserve gasoline. The federal government decided that all states would enforce it. The radar gun is from that particular time period. Uh, you'll remember the CB radios, the uh, Civil Citizen Band, and we're talking about Mounties, Mounties taking pictures. Well, this is the device they were talking about. There's a little round dial that's underneath the canvas there, and that would be sticking out the back window behind the driver. And then as you drove by, the device would tell the speed that the car was going at. Other things left in the, the old jail are these... Uh, Nightsticks and batons for the deputies. Uh, there is a belaying pin, which is a weapon in the front. Some evidence of a book cut out trying to smuggle a uh, pipe into the jail to smoke illegal uh, drugs and a blackjack. Now on the book, uh, someone said, do, why do you think, well, were they successful on getting that pipe into the old jail? And I said, well, like we have the books. So I don't think they were successful. The, uh, we have some of the graffiti on the wall. And the, right in the center there, you'll see Popeye going to Olive Oil's house. And the uh, left, hand, to left hand of him, you'll see February 6, 1972. More to the left, you'll see pinochle scores and tic tac toe games. Ah, 
Now, on this one in the right-hand corner, you'll see uh, a likeness of um, Bob Hope, for those of us who remember. In the upper middle, you'll see a devil. Uh, in the center, you'll see a man pretty well dressed on that. You'll see a lot of words written on the thing. Now, you'll see some white paint. We were painting out the ruder words, and we were told we couldn't really do that. Um, so we, we stopped, we now hang little uh, insignias and other things around on the wall uh, so people don't see the rude okay. words. This is the back wall. Again, you'll see uh, on the right-hand side, we think it's Reagan saying some rude words. Then we have a Kilroy was here, a uh, thing in the middle, and to the left, you'll see how the jail looked in a prison with the toilets in place and some words on that. Now, one of the things I have on this particular room when people come in is, I have to tell you this by OSHA standards, please do not lick the walls. We know there is lead paint here. We just came out of the uh, graffiti room. We're now going over to the left into the uh, walk around. Uh, you can see the sh uh, Frenchie in the back, and you see both doors, the inner door of the cell and the outer door of the cell. You also notice that the place isn't too wide, and that is to keep too many people from going towards the jailer. If a jailer was going to get rushed, the, uh, he, only one person could fit through the doors or down the stairs, so two people couldn't come at him. Now I'll turn you back over to my wife. Thank you, Charles, and uh, my apologies for interrupting you. Now we're going to go into what is arguably the most favorite space in the building. This is called the bullpen. And in one corner, we have our mug shot opportunity. Uh, people come with their cell phones to take pictures of themselves standing in front of the um, the numbered board on the side, holding up their number for uh, being a prisoner, and it's something that they all enjoy. <clears throat> uh, I just call it um, the blackmail time. Hold your finger up a little higher. The two cells in this room are made of steel, which came from Carnegie in Pittsburgh and is so stamped on the top. There was built into this layout some security considerations. The entrance door to, to the room on the right has a special window, which allows the jailer to get a 180 degree view of the interior so that some prisoners were given more freedom than others and could walk around the exterior of the cells with the room door locked. There are many stories of prisoners opening the windows here and calling out to students walking by to the ball field. And they tried to get um, the students to buy them soda or candy from the little store next door. At the entrance to the cells themselves is the mechanism which opened the cell doors. We do not permit anyone to use this device as we don't want any visitors to get locked in. The interior walkway to the two cells is here with the jailer. When the society took on renovations, there was so much rust on these bars that they had to be sandblasted. That rust was bottled and each bottle sold for a dollar to raise money for the renovations. Our jailer probably had other work in addition to watching prisoners. He could be a fisherman, or own a business in town, as did Joe Lachlan's great-granddad. This is the interior of one of the two cells. Originally, each of these two cells had four bunks, but two were removed in each cell to make more room for visitors. 
At the rear, near the floor, is a plumbing opening for when there was a sink and toilet in each cell. But now we have just the chamber pot. It must be remembered that the other rooms in the jail were also cells, but are now used to tell the history of the building. The prisoner's suit is from the first jail that was constructed in Bolivia and which was torn down to make room for the second jail, uh, which is the current one. There have been several movies filmed in this jail, and one of them was a film short, the final scene of which was filmed in this cell with the actor wearing this suit. At the time, I wanted to watch, but I was told that I could not because the actor needed to emote without an audience. Also, Crimes of the Heart had scenes here with Sissy Spacek in one of the cells. And we have had a display from uh, that movie here in the past, which is always popular. We now exit the second floor and our tour. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you will visit in person when we are able to reopen. Our usual schedule is April through October, Wednesdays and Saturdays, 12.30 to 3.30, but do check our webpage or Facebook for any changes. And thank you so much for joining us. But now we would be glad to entertain any questions you may have. Uh, Nancy, we do have some um, uh, questions or comments and questions in chat. Uh, Mary Ellen made a couple comments. She said the quilt on the bed was nice, the one that was in the uh, 1904 room. Um, and she also, when um, uh, Joseph Lachlan was talking, she said, I remember hearing of Mr. Lachlan that worked at the hospital and Mrs. Lachlan was a well-respected school teacher. Hmm. Um, Mike Powell has a question um, that says, hey, Joe, was Sam Brinkman one of your relatives? I believe he served with Dunbar Davis and married his daughter. Is that true? Mm -hmm. uh, th that was true. Um, uh, Sam was my um, great um, grandfather and it was uh, my my father's favorite grandfather. Uh, in fact, for a while, my father actually lived with Sam. And uh, he is credited with the house uh, where my grandparents lived um, on Caswell that is now uh, Jenny Raymond's and uh, recently had the fire. And also, um, I think it's Nash Street, um, around, kind of around the corner. Um, there is at least the footprint of uh, the house that my father knew um, that my grandfather had, or great grandfather had. Um, yeah, they, they remodeled that about 15 years or so ago, and it uh, it's it's the same footprint, but it's certainly not the same house. <laughs> Things change. <laughs> So uh, Dawn Taylor said that she had to head to work, uh, but she said thank you. She enjoyed today's meeting. Ginger Harper said excellent job to all of you that participated. And Dottie says great job, Nancy, Charles, and all. So, did the <laughs> Dottie, does, uh, does anybody have any other um, questions or comments for anybody at any of the speakers? It was really well done. I felt like I'd been visiting the jail, the pictures and the, all of uh, the, the way you arranged the tour. It just felt like we were going right through it. So nice job. Uh, Ginger says Bill Corrin was Todd Corrin's dad. Right. 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 We're all in agreement. <laughs> yep. Yep. And Herman Strong, his grandfather. All right, Bob, did you have 
You're on mute, Bob, if you're talking. Hmm. Nancy, that was great. Thank you. Thank and you. Joe. And Charles. <laughs> and Charlie. <laughs> Thank you, Ginger. Good to see you. You all did great. I just loved it. Yes, I did too. This is a good way to reach people that otherwise would not have known things. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Carolee Morris says, enjoyed this tour. Thanks to all of you for adjusting to these unusual times. Mm. I'd just like to say that I did visit the jail probably back in 2012 or somewhere around there. And I have not been back. But what I saw today, there's been a lot of improvement. Yes, I've seen it before, and this is much, much yeah. Well, good. Tell your friends. Thank you. Will do. Thank you, Christian <laughs> Sons. And hi, Jane. Good to see Jane Martin. Yep, yep. yep. Hi, Thank Jane. you, Joe. Great. Yeah, Thank you all. Thanks, everybody, for today's program. Joe, I didn't know all that. I thought I knew most of your history. I didn't know a lot of that. So, <laughs> And all of you did a wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Job. All of you. Sure. Good to see you, Jane. Good to see all of you. And Jim says, excellent presentation. So everybody seemed to enjoy it. Great job. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Jane, I got your letter. I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for putting it on. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.